fires with the help of the local uh, RFS volunteers <coughs> and the effects of the fires in the woody shrubland, the areas of very large fuel, which looked like that before the fire, a very high fuel load, a great risk uh, of bushfire uh, after the fire um, and then 14 months after the fire. This is exactly what ever, all of the experienced uh, people who live and work in the area of the Snowy Plains have predicted. The shrubs have been uh, killed, the grasses and herbs are recovering strongly, growing well, and we expect that the effect in terms of the reduced fuel load from, from that to that would probably last for five to seven years. But a very good treatment uh, in terms of reducing the fuel load and the bushfire risk. Uh, there's no doubt that we got it uh, wrong in parts, if you like. The fire was hotter in some places, cooler in others. But that's the nature of fire. But one of the points that has come out of this, and it's not, uh, it wasn't we didn't set out to find this, was that there's more water now available in the burnt plots than in the unburnt plots. This is a graph of water potential. Now, it's a little bit difficult to explain, but you can read it as being the closer to zero, uh, the more water is available. And so this, where it's closer to zero than this, has more water available. Now, water potential, I don't want to, I'll spend five minutes explaining water potential, but it's a measure of the tension under which plant water is held in plants. And if you measure it at dawn, the plant is equilibrated with the soil, and this is as good a measure of soil water potential as it is of plant water potential. And so in these burnt plots, where we have reduced the leaf area by removing the understory, we have increased the availability of water. Now that increase, it, more water available in the soil is more water available for runoff uh, and for, for rivers. And so in contrast to the bushfire, where we take out all of the vegetation and then it all regrows with a massive increase in leaf area, and we use more water, the vegetation uses more water after a bushfire. If we use prescribed fire, we can get the reverse effect. After prescribed fire, because we've only taken out the understory and we've replaced the large leaf area of the shrubs with a much reduced leaf area of grasses and herbs, we can have exactly the opposite effect. We can make more water available through using prescribed fire. So going back to our, my take home message, transpiration dictates how much water will ever come out of a forested system. Transpiration dominates. So if we can regulate transpiration, we can regulate water yield. Transpiration remains the single most important component of catchment water balance. We've now got a comprehensive network of calibration sites. We can use planned fire to not only control fuel loads, but also we can use it to increase water yield. Now the I'm just going to put all of this up. All of these messages are simple and straightforward, but they are increasingly backed up by hard data. For the whole of the Eastern Highlands, from Melbourne to Canberra, we are facing uh, declining water yields over coming years because we've had bushfires. The regrowth after the bushfires is going to reduce water yield 30%, uh, I think, is a conservative estimate. There's been less rainfall in the last 15 years, undoubtedly, than there has been in the decades before. We have had more interception because we've allowed this development of a heavy understory. And we are going to have more fire in coming years unless we do something. More bushfires creating more regrowth unless we do something. Our options, do more planned burning where we can, manage the understory, or thin. We, we should be seriously investigating 
thinning in those forests where we can't do prescribed burning. And this means the mountain ash forests uh, around Melbourne in particular. Now, what I haven't talked to you today about is some of the other interesting things that have come out of our work in the high country. The fact that the soils on the snowy plains are methane oxidizers. They are oxidizing methane at a rate equivalent to the rate at which methane is produced by the cows. Now when we start talking about a carbon pollution reduction scheme, emissions trading scheme, and we're perfectly willing to take all of the bad news stories about how many uh, kilograms of methane are belched by ruminant animals each and every year, but completely unwilling to consider the beneficial effects of soils, and specifically, in, in this case, the effects of soils on methane, which is that they can take out of the atmosphere as much as a, a herd of 100 cattle grazing in the high country for four months of the year. Then I think we've reached a height of political stupidity, if I can put due reference to our, our political colleagues. So my, my message though, to come back to water, and it's water that I really wanted to talk to you about today, is that we can do something. We have lost the art, we've lost the political will to do prescribed fires, we have to get that back. And I think that's really the, the, the most important thing when we are now paying <coughs> literally billions of dollars for water using desalination plants. It is almost, um, it is in my mind criminal that we don't manage our forests as efficiently as we could. Uh, and so Melbourne's water catchments, and this is where I'll finish, okay. Melbourne's water catchments have been managed on a strategy of hope. I just hope like hell it wasn't on my watch when they all went up in flames. Uh, the last year has, uh, is going to mean that future generations of Melbournians are not going to have the amount of water that they had. Uh, Unfortunately, that strategy is now being adopted throughout uh, southeastern Australia, and I actually think that this might eventually tip us towards a more sensible uh, approach to land management in coming years. And with the help of the local uh, RFS 